Hello my friends and welcome back to another Baldur's Gate 3 build guide. Hope you're all doing well. Today we're going to do something a little bit different and I'm going to cover uh, one of the most requested videos for my channel, a guide to an entire party for Honor Mode. This build will be around four characters that work together really well, each of which is an extremely powerful character in its own right, but that also have synergy with one another to make an even more powerful party to make Honor Mode a breeze. For this video, we're going to focus on a relatively simple, but still extremely powerful and easy run through Honor Mode so that we can use this party as a baseline. I think that this party is going to be one of the best possible picks if you're looking to get an honor mode win, um, while also being relatively easy to build and put together and very easy to play, which is something that I, I think is very important when you're looking at an honor mode run. I'm going to be considering three different factors for these builds. One is, of course, how powerful are the builds themselves. Two is, how well do they work together? So we're trying to build a party that works extremely well together. Um, and three is how forgiving is it to play over the course of a long honor mode run. These builds should all be relatively simple to play, both in terms of uh, not requiring a ton of Com mechanical complexity during your actual play, but also being forgiving of mistakes, and that's something that I think is very important for an honor mode uh, party to consider. And it should also be, I'm also considering two other factors when building this party. One is you probably want to actually play the game, so we're going to be discounting builds that just completely cheese the game by one-shotting every enemy or never engaging in combat or whatever. Obviously, there are some ways to totally break the game, but this build, this party build is intended to actually play through the game. Um, and two, uh, that you don't need to make specific item choices or story choices or use specific elithid powers or anything because I want this to be a solid baseline. So there's a lot of room for customization and variance. We will not be requiring you to make any specific story choices in order to make any of these builds function. They also have no overlap in terms of item requirements. In fact, only one of them I think actually needs a, a specific item at all, although some of them will have items that are very good for them and we'll talk about those as we get through the build. So overall, this party will work extremely well together because there's nothing that conflicts when you're building these four characters and also all of them support each other in a really interesting, powerful, and unique ways. I've done complete build guides to all four of these builds previously, so I will tell you what uh, video to go check out if you're interested in looking up more about these builds. Um, and I'll just be going over each of them, what choices we're making, and so on. Another important goal for me in making this build, this party guide, is that it has no weak points in its playthrough. So these builds are all intended to come online very early and play very smoothly all throughout the game. So there's no point where you're going to be struggling um, or waiting to get power spikes at later levels or anything like that. All right, let's jump in and start talking about the builds. Our first build is where a lot of our damage is going to come from. We're going for an Eldritch Knight Thrower so that this party can output massive amounts of extremely reliable damage. For my build video for this character, check out The Consistent Killer, where I go over this build in uh, significant detail. The strengths of this build are that it almost never misses attacks after level 4, because you get to break bounded accuracy with Tavern Brawler. It's a ranged attacker, so you can operate across the entire battlefield very safely, and it just outputs massive damage, including some of the highest burst damage in the game. Thanks to Action Surge and the many attacks that you get per turn, you have one of the highest possible turn 1 damage outputs in the game, so you can shut down just about any important enemy with a uh, extremely reliable uh, damage and massive damage. You'll have 90 plus percent chance to hit. We'll get seven attacks in the opening round of combat uh, it, at the late levels, each of which will be hitting for somewhere between 40 and 70 damage, depending on what gear exactly we've found and how many buffs we've decided to layer onto this character. And so you're going to be dealing somewhere in the neighborhood of 250 to 300 damage on your Nova turns with options to go as high as four or 500 if you uh, end up with a lot of additional boosts. That means that you can kill just about any 
enemy in the game in a single round, um, so the most powerful enemy in any combat will fall to this character without any help from your allies, freeing them up to deal with all of the other threats. The reason that this character is also so good is that it's very, very safe. You get great defensive spells, and you get a lot of defensive utility, and it's very self-sufficient in that sense, because you get all of your utility spells that you would normally need a caster to carry. Um, this character can bring instead, freeing up your caster's spell slots for more summons, more offensive spells, more defensive spells, because this character, as a martial character, brings all of its own utility, while also outputting massive damage. To build this character, there are two stat splits that we can pick. Either you can start with this stat split with 8 strength and 17 constitution, and then you get a little more dexterity um, and slightly better wisdom, and then you just have to drink an elixir of strength every single day if you're doing that. No other builds in this party require it, so I think that's a totally reasonable thing to do. But if you don't like the elixirs, and um, then you can also build with a more... Standard stat split, where you take 17 in strength, and then you take 14 dexterity, 16 constitution, and 10 wisdom. This will be a little bit weaker, obviously, because you're not using the strength elixirs, but in terms of stats, but it does free up your character to use a different elixir, so you can get even more attacks or additional damage from a bloodlust elixir or something like that, or one of the resistance elixirs if you are worried about going into particular fights. So there's definitely advantages either way, um, and of course this frees you up from having to drink an elixir of strength every day if you go for this stat split. I'm going to build the the build assuming we're using the no elixirs stat split, but I will mention how it will deviate if you're using elixirs every day. For our fighting style, we're just going to go ahead and take defense fighting style. You have to unselect it because it's bugged. Defense fighting style gets us an extra AC, and this character will have incredibly high AC plus the shield spell, so be basically impossible to hit with actual attack rolls. Um, we're using Lazel as the example character here, but you can do this with pretty much any character. A dwarf is often favorite for um, throwing builds, but of course all the normally powerful ones apply, like Wood Elf for the bonus movement speed, Halfling to reroll ones, and so on. Um, but I think that we'll just use Lazel as the example here. And Githyanki is a pretty good one because the extra Misty Step and, and so on is very powerful for this build. And that's it for level 1. Let's jump to level 2. Level 2 we get Action Surge, so no other decisions that we have to make. Level 3 we are going for an Eldritch Knight build. This gets us Weapon Bond, allowing us to throw any weapon. In the late game, so you're just looking for any weapon with the Throne weapon property, um, and then you can bond to that weapon, it will come back, so you can use the most powerful two-handed weapons in the game if you want, or one-handed weapons in, uh, as well, um, just to increase your damage. For our cantrip selection for this build, we get to take some utility cantrips on this character, so this character can carry a lot of our utility cantrips for the whole game. Um, you're probably going to want Blade Ward anyways, it's great just to have as an emergency button, and this party gets enough defensive capabilities that Blade Ward is very powerful. And then this can be your Minor Illusion character, you could also take Mage Hand instead of Blade Ward at this level if you wanted to. We're going to take Shield here, and then it's great to have Magic Missile available on a martial character just for when you need guaranteed damage, so we'll grab that. And then from our expanded spell list, we're going to grab Long Strider, allowing this character to be your Long Strider user. You don't need too many different spells on this character, so having Long Strider available is very useful um, in every party. Every party wants Long Strider mandatorily, and so having being able to take it on your uh, Eldritch Knight rather than have to use a caster's spell slot for it is pretty nice, because then that frees up your caster to take other spells. For our feet, of course, we're taking Tavern Brawler, and you either select Strength if you are not using Elixirs, or Con if you are. Tavern Brawler doubles your attack rolls and damage with thrown weapons, so it completely breaks the game, because you'll hit with basically 100% accuracy doing massively more damage than you would otherwise. Spell selection here doesn't really matter. Um, so we'll just take kind of whatever. I, I guess probably you want Chromatic Orb just to make Ice Surfaces. Fighter level 5, we get extra attack, and you can now replace um, one of these with an expanded spell slot. I recommend taking Enhanced Leap. Enhanced Leap is another great utility spell that doesn't cost spell, spell slots, so it saves all your spell slots for shield if you need it, and is extremely powerful on a high-strength character like this, because it means you can jump as far as you want, so you can position this character anywhere in combat. 
fighter level 6, we get another feat, and we're going to take our strength up to 20. Um, another option here is to take alert, but this character does really want to get high strength, because high strength is very valuable, of course. And so we're going to delay alert a little bit on this character. I do recommend getting alert on every non-dexterity character for honor mode, just so you can win initiative very easily. Um, but we're going to delay it a little bit on this character. If you're the elixirs build, then you just grab alert at this level. The next level, we're actually going to deviate from Fighter for one level in order to increase our burst damage, as well as the utility of the character, and we're going to take a level of Cleric for War Cleric. War Cleric allows you to make three extra attacks as a bonus action, and that can include a thrown weapon uh, per day, and so that takes our attacks in the opening round of combat from four to plus two more with Action Surge to five, uh, using our bonus action attack from War Cleric. Five attacks in the opening round of combat is a lot, and that's one reason I favor the Eldritch Knight build over the Berserker build for a thrown weapon character for honor mode, because, um, although obviously both of those are incredibly powerful builds, and we'll do party builds with both of them, um, but it's just slightly more burst damage at the beginning of combat. You just get more attacks. And it's also, generally speaking, much safer to play because you have shield and very, very strong AC and stuff. So you are, um, although it's not like the Berserker build is fragile or anything, but you're even less fragile than the Berserker build. Um, for our cantrip selection, we'll just take a bunch of utility spells. We'll already have guidance on other characters, but it's nice to be able to pick up utility spells that we don't otherwise have. And more copies of guidance is not terrible, but we'll just grab light and produce flame um, so we can light areas here or uh, whatever. You can pick up resistance if you want for dialogue, something like this. The cantrip selection isn't that important for this character because we'll have our cantrips at this point covered by other characters, but... Um, you can just make sure that you have all the, the abilities that you need covered in your party. For our prepared spells, there's three options that really make sense. I guess four options that really make sense for this character. Sanctuary is always incredible to have in honor mode. It's just a great panic button. Healing Word is good in lots of fights, so you may want to prepare that sometimes. Just if you, in case your party goes down, it gives you a bonus action on your fighter to get a party member back up, which is always useful. Um... Bless is great. You can concentrate on Bless on this character, because your Cleric is going to be concentrating on other stuff. Though, your party will probably be blessed by the items that cast Bless on healing, but it's still very useful to be able to concentrate on Bless on a character like this, who doesn't have better stuff to concentrate on. So, by default, I think Bless is the best pick, but Sanctuary or Healing Word are also good, and Creator and Destroy Water also has lots of synergies as well. At the next level, we're going back to Fighter, because we want to hit our third attack from the Fighter level 11 feature, so that's very important. Um, for our spell selection here, there's nothing that is particularly valuable for this character at this level, because we don't have access to um, Misty Step yet. We'll get that next level. So we're just going to take two utility spells, Darkness and Arcane Lock, uh, for example, and you can use those to cheese certain encounters, both very useful. Go to fighter level 8, and we'll grab our last feat. We're going to pick up alert here, because alert is incredibly powerful, and I like getting this on every character for honor mode. It just makes your gameplay so much easier when you always win initiative. Um, and then for our expanded spell list, we're going to pick up Misty Step. We can replace spells if we want to. We could replace Arcane Lock with something like Cloud of Daggers or uh, Flaming Sphere or Invisibility. Just more utility spells are possible. Magic Weapon is also not terrible for this character to concentrate on. Just a slight increase to your own damage is pretty reasonable. But I, I think I, in general, I prefer having this character be concentrating on Bless. Misty Step is the important one, though. And then at fighter level 9, we get Indomitable, letting us reroll our saving throws. If you're the Elixir build, this actually means you have plus 2 to your wisdom saves and reroll them, so you're going to be passing uh, wisdom saves quite reliably on that build. On this version of the build without Elixirs, you will probably want some way to improve your saving throws, so you're going to look for items that improve that, as well as give yourself fear immunity with Hero's Feast and, and similar effect. Calm Emotions is also very useful. Because one of the weaknesses of this character, and in fact the only way this character can die, basically, is if you get hit by a debilitating wisdom saving throw effect that ruins your character's abilities.
Then at the next level, we are going to be picking up more cantrips, just utility cantrips at this point. So we'll grab an extra copy of Mage Hand, for example, and our spell selection doesn't matter at all. Um... Although I should mention, actually, as you're building the character, when you hit character level 11, you probably want to respec to go to fighter 11, cleric 0, and then take the cleric level again at uh, level 12, just because that will get you your third attack for the duration of level 11. That's not critically important, but it is a small optimization you can make with a respec. And then finally, you get your last fighter level, um, get your improved extra attack. There's again no spells that you particularly need here, so we're just going to take kind of uh, whatever we think might be funny to cast on occasion, because the only thing that you need this character to do at this point is to... Um, with its spells is to cast shield and misty step as well as the utility spells but the fact that it brings all the utility spells for your party is very powerful and so we're just going to grab whatever and now we have a character that makes seven attacks in the opening round of combat let me cancel out of that um seven attacks in the opening round of combat each of which is for massive damage and uh is also extremely survivable we have a base of 21 AC with full plate because we get heavy armor. This this AC this armor has uh, 18 has 19 base AC. So with just normal full plate, we'll have 18. But obviously, you get to wear the best heavy armor available. So in the end game, you'll probably have about 25 AC with a shield and full plate armor, um, and then you are able to use any weapon but probably Nyrolna in the end game in order to do massive damage. You don't need any other particular items, although the Ring of Flinging is pretty good for this character, but there's really no other item requirements at all for this character, just uh, whatever increases your damage, so any items that have increased damage on hit are very good for this character, um, and just any weapon with the throne property. Nyrolna in the late game is going to be best in slot for the most part, and you're going to be applying your Tavern Brawler damage and doing massive uh, damage output with every single throw, which is going to kill enemies extremely quickly. So when you put it all together, this character does massive numbers of attacks for brutal damage, each outputting massive amounts of damage, uh, operates safely from any range, and is basically invincible from enemy attacks because you have extremely high base AC and can cast shield several times per day. We have up to seven shields per day. We also have mobility with Misty Step and Enhanced Leap, as well as providing Long Strider to the entire team, which is very powerful if you're not using a camp caster or something to do that. Um, so this character overall just is where we get all of our damage, and I think this is maybe my number one pick in total for an honor mode build. It's just so reliable and so good at damage, provides so much burst damage that it's going to be just a rock solid foundation to build any team comp off of. For the second of the four builds, we're going to build our tank. And I'm using the term somewhat loosely here because this build is actually going to be a wizard. We're going to get all the, the powerful utility and control and casting effects of wizard as well as access to all the secret spells while not putting our characters at risk by using Abjuration Wizard. Abjuration Wizard makes a character who is a fully functional wizard, an extremely powerful character, but with none of the associated risk because of projected uh, because of the arcane ward reducing incoming damage. For my full build guide on this, you can see the invincible tank wizard, um, and this character is I think one of the easily most broken characters in Baldur's Gate because of how powerful Arcane Ward is and how easy it is to stack, and you can stack it up to massive values, uh, reduce enemy incoming damage, do enormous retaliation damage with um, Armor of Agathis and Fire Shield, while also operating as a fully functional wizard, concentrating on a powerful control spell, spamming out damage spells, and, and so on. This also synergizes really well with the rest of our party because the projected ward can help protect any vulnerable members of our party if they get attacked, and this character is going to be mostly drawing a lot of fire. Because this party is going to have very high ACs across the board, we still get to have high AC on this character and have it be attacked very frequently, um, which is really nice as well. We're going to start with a level of sorcerer to gain con save proficiencies as well as... Um, Armor of Agathis, so we're going for Draconic Sorcerer, and we'll take White Dragon Sorcerer. 
um, because that gets us Armor of Agathis while getting us con save proficiencies as well as better skill access and a bunch of additional spells. For our cantrip selection here, you want all the utility cantrips on this character. This won't be our party face, so we don't need to worry about taking friends or anything like that, but we can take... Minor Illusion, Mage Hand. Very important to have Blade Ward on this character, because self-casting Blade Ward is going to be really valuable to maximize your survivability. Um, since this is a tank, you can spend turns just casting Blade Ward on yourself, gaining resistance that halves incoming damage, and then it's reduced by the Arcane Ward, so enemy damage will be reduced to almost zero. And uh, then we'll just grab Light or something like that. Or this is a good spot to fit in True Strike. Um, then we are going to, for our spell selection, you just don't want spells that have save DCs because our charisma is going to be very low. We'll grab shield on this character. Even though you can get hit very easily and it, it's not a problem if this character gets hit, you uh, it's even better if you don't get hit. So shield is often still valuable on this character as well. And this one can also take magic missile just so you have a second copy of that. Um, and then for our ability selection here, we are going to take... Uh, intelligence and Constitution primaries. And Dexterity and Wisdom. And this character just gets to be a very clean stat spread that will have very high intelligence for our Save DC wizard spells, as well as great um, concentration saving throws with con 16 con and con proficiency. We'll never lose concentration on anything, as well as decent wisdom saves and so on. Then at character level 2, we get to take a level of Wizard. Um, this is the character that has a, like, at level 2, you're not that strong, but you're still reasonably strong. And once you hit level th uh, level 4 with this character, you're basically invincible. So this is the character that does have the most lead time of any of these builds, but the other builds are so strong early that it shouldn't be a problem for you in these early fights. We're going to grab the cantrips that we need, and we definitely want Ray of Frost. This is also a great place to fit in Bone Chill on this uh, character, and this will Bone Chill is very useful to have access to to prevent enemy healing. So you want both Ray of Frost and Bone Chill somewhere in the party. This character can just take both. And then we've already got our utility cantrips, so you can actually take Shocking Grasp on this character as well if that's something that you really want access to. There are times when it will come up because this character has lots of wet synergy, although it's worth noting that sometimes you want to provoke opportunity attacks with this character so you get hit and do the Armor of Agathis return damage. For prepared spells, we're going to grab normal wizard spells. Obviously, we already have shield and magic missile, so we're just going to take uh, grease and chromatic orb are the most important ones, and then uh, fill the rest out with other utility spells, depending on what we need. Fog cloud is also very useful to have access to. You could take find familiar early, though uh, later on you're going to replace that with the unique familiar. Most likely, if you make that story choice. Then we're going to take Abjuration Wizard, so we can start building Arcane Ward. And just make sure you're selecting Abjuration spells as you're leveling up, so you can easily stack your Arcane Ward. Wizard level 3, we're going to make sure we have Arcane Lock, and then you always want Cloud of Daggers uh, in the party, and this is a great character to concentrate on it. You can have multiple Clouds of Daggers up as well. Arcane Lock is just how you stack Arcane Ward outside of combat at this level. For our feat selection, this character can actually get away with lower intelligence, so there are two possible options here. Either hit um, it, hit higher intelligence early, or just equip this character with any save DC item to still hit higher save DCs on your saving throw related spells. But this character also benefits very strongly from alert, and it's nice to just have plus seven initiative on all of your characters, so might as well grab that as early as possible, and then just continue to win initiative. If you win initiative with this character, you get to run it right into the middle of combat so the enemies will focus it and protect your uh, more vulnerable party members by absorbing damage with your arcane ward. No particularly important spells, although Flaming Sphere is always good to have on every character. Um, and then we can take something like Web to foul up enemy movements. 
and uh, Misty Step. This character, of course, will have, uh, I guess, sorry, uh, Gale in this save has some spells already known, so that's messing me up a little bit, but you'll, you'll definitely want Misty Step on this character at level 2 as well. Obviously, your spell selection, because you're a wizard, is going to depend a little bit on what scrolls you've found. Just take whichever ones you haven't found, but Misty Step is the key here, and one of the great things about this party is every character gets access to Misty Step pretty easily. Later levels, we get access to Counterspell, which someone did actually correct me on my previous um, Abjuration Wizard. Counterspell does uh, give you Arcane Ward stack, so that's even better, and it's nice that we get Counterspell on this character as well. We'll have two Counterspells on this character, as well as a bunch of other defensive options, so enemies will never be able to cast dangerous spells. And then make sure you have Glyph of Warding, because this is your main combat spell. It's an Abjuration spell, so it stacks your ward, as well as just doing great damage and, and control. Haste is really good to cast from this character. Any of the powerful Concentration Disables are very good to know as well. Um, wizard level 6, we get Projected Ward, which gives us another defensive reaction. So now, for example, our Eldritch Knight, who has 22 base AC and shield up to 27 AC, can also have damage blocked if somehow an enemy gets through that. So it's even more impossible for you to actually get hurt on, on this party. Uh, make sure you pick up resistances where possible. Protection from energy can be useful. Um, you can also grab Animate Dead on this character because you can run around with summons as well. Adds just to your party longevity. At this next level, make sure you get Fire Shield because it increases the, the damage return. And you can also pick up Conjure Minor Elemental. This character is a great candidate to just have a bunch of summons running around with you as well. If that's something that you uh, don't mind doing. Obviously, some people don't like to do that, so there's plenty of other options for spells. Great control spells like Ice Storm or Banishment, of course, um, and of course, whatever you find scrolls for. Uh, Fire Shield is great. You can cast it on cold. If an enemy is wet, they'll be taking a bunch of damage return from your Armor of Agathis and your Cold Shield, and so anytime you get hit, you deal massive damage in return and take probably no damage yourself. At this next wizard level, we just increase our intelligence. Um, we will be casting some spells with save DCs, so you do want some save DC gear on this character if you go for alert. You don't need alert on this character, but I really like just having it on every single build for honor mode, because winning initiative just makes your fights so much easier. Make sure we get ice surfaces and stuff so that enemies are constantly falling over, and banishment is great to have on some party member because banishment can target charisma saves so lots of enemies will basically auto fail because some bosses have extremely low charisma saves at the next level we also get access to conjure elemental um because and that gives us even more access to summons and other powerful late game spells another spell that's worth noting on this character is that this is your wall of fire character so for encounters that Wall of Fire is solved in. This is the character to concentrate on Wall of Fire with. I'll show you a prepared spell list at the end of the, the build here. Cantrip selection doesn't matter so much, and we will just pick two more random spells, because at this point, we're really just looking for spells with unique effects, and it will be depend very heavily on what scrolls we've found for this character. You should pretty much always learn every scroll that you find. And then finally, this character does get access to Globe of Invulnerability, which is another way to just auto-win some encounters, and is really awesome. And uh, for our other 6th level spell, I'm actually going to suggest that we take a Wall of Ice, although Disintegrate, there's uh, one fight where Disintegrate is pretty nice, and this will help you win the, the final boss battle if you have Disintegrate. Um, and Globe of Invulnerability wins basically every other difficult boss battle in the game, so this character provides that, that kind of utility as well. And so, uh, putting it together, let's do a prepared spell list for Gale here. <laughs> I don't know why it's lagging so much. Um, we're going to pick up Globe of Invulnerability and Wall of Ice and then Conjure Elemental. Most of the time, your level 6 spell slots for most... Uh, 
days are going to be casting the level 6 Conjure Elemental and then refreshing your spell slot with uh, Markahesh Cure or another item that refreshes your spell slot and recasting a level 6 Armor of Agathis. Then we're going to have lower l level uh, combat spells. We need our two key abjuration spells here. Sleet Storm is great for giant ice surfaces. We can have, uh, we want fire shield as well. We can have multiple summons. And then at lower levels, we need the important utility spells like Misty Step, Magic Missile, and uh, Grease, and so on. All of those are very useful to have access to and give you a ton of additional options throughout the day. Anything else you can take here, like powerful control spells like Fear and Hypnotic Pattern to make sure that you have access to the best ones in every single combat. Um, and Haste, of course, is always great to concentrate on on this character as well. So lots of different options for the spell list. So long as you have Counterspell and Glyph of Warding and Armor of Agathis, this character's spell list is perfect. Um, Misty Step is very helpful as well, of course. But there are lots of other options that will just solve encounters on their own, like Globe of Invulnerability, like Wall of Fire, and, and other spells like that. For items for this character, which doesn't really compete with uh, other characters for items, mostly, but you just want anything that increases your save DCs, that's very powerful, um, because this character is going to be doing some save DC spells, but mostly you just want anything that has damage reduction on it, so stuff like the Bone Spike Garb is very good, it just reduces incoming damage even further. Um, the Snowburst Ring can be pretty useful when you're dealing a lot of cold damage, and because this character has its uh, intelligence uses its intelligence as its primary casting stat. This is going to be your um, scrolls and illithid powers character, probably, and so you also want to put Mark a Heshkir on the, on this character in the late game. Other than that, no specific item requirements for this character. Just save DC, increasing gear, defensive gear, and anything that increases cold damage is very valuable for you as well. Your typical strategy with this character is run into the middle of the fight, drop down a bunch of uh, uh, glyphs of warding on top of enemies and just watch them blow themselves up by hitting you while your f your ranged characters pepper them from afar with thrown weapon attacks and the other attacks that we'll get into shortly with the rest of the builds. Build number three is fun because we're actually going to use a mono class build for this build. We're just going to go with a good old straight up light cleric. The reason for this is twofold. Light cleric is adds a ton of utility to this party and is just a very powerful build in and of itself, as well as having great damage options from its spells, but also it gives us access to uh, a yet another powerful defensive option with warding flare and later improved warding flare, making it even harder for us to get into trouble with our party, and it gives us access to one of the most broken mechanics in the game in the form of radiating orbs. By adding in a bunch of uh, radiant damage from Light Cleric, we can use radiating orbs to stack hit penalties on bosses, preventing them from ever being a threat in the late game, and making this party very, very resilient because it is so hard for bosses to hit us. When we have Improved Warding Flare, Projected Ward, and Shield all on our Eldritch Knight, for example, they'll have 27 AC, enemies will have disadvantage to attack them, and if they do get hit, the, the uh, damage will be reduced by up to, 20, uh, up to 22 by our Wizard's Projected Ward, meaning that they are going to take massively less damage from every possible source, and uh, also it's just going to be extremely hard for most enemies to hit us because we're going to be stacking radiating orbs on them with the Light Cleric. To that end, we are just taking Light Domain Cleric, and we're just going to go straight 12 levels in it so that we get access to all the best things. Warding Flare is very powerful for this character, of course, because it gives you a bunch of defensive options, and you get to start with medium armor. For our cantrip selection, we already got Light, but we're just going to make sure that we have the uh, best utility cantrips in the game, as well as produce flame. This gives us access to all three damaging utility cantrips as well. A ray of frost can create puddles, or can create ice surfaces. Produce flame can set fires, and bone chill can stop enemy healing. So all of those together give us all the best utility cantrips in the game uh, for when we need them. And then for our stat spread, because clerics are so single attribute dependent, we actually get to take a really convenient stat spread that gets us uh, very high AC and initiative while still hitting. Uh, the maximum dexterity and constitution. So we're going to go for a 15, 16, 17 split, leaving the other three at eight. Um, and that'll get us to 20 wisdom while still having 16 dexterity. Combined with one of the medium armors that doesn't have capped AC, this will give us as high or better AC than a 
heavy armor user on this character, so we're going to be sitting at like base 21 or 22 on this character as well, combined with Warding Flare, that makes us very hard to hit on this character also. I always get questions about this stat split. Also, uh, people get mad about the odd numbers. This is the highest you can get three individual stats in Dungeons & Dragons. Believe me, if we could take three 16s, we would. But uh, if we want to hit 16, 16, 18, this is, the high this is the stat split we have to take. You could take a 14, 16, 16 split if you really wanted an extra point of strength for the first few levels of the game, um, and then respec later. I don't think it's that important, so we just start with the odd numbers. At this next level, we are we get access to Radiance of the Dawn, a very powerful early game spell. This is a huge nuke in the early game, and is a big part of what makes this character so powerful. I should also mention prepared spells for this character. Of course, you're going to get Sanctuary, so we're going to have three char characters capable of casting Sanctuary by the end of this party build, uh, which gives us a lot of emergency options if we need them. Command is the... Uh, Probably a top five spell in the game and one of the best control spells in the game. Very good to have access to early. We get Healing Word, we get Bless, and we get, uh, say, a Guiding Bolt in order to do damage in the early game. Later on, we'll replace it with Create Water when our wizard is doing more cold damage, because this character can be our Create Water user if we need to. Character level 3, we just get Spiritual Weapon, and we get Flaming Sphere and Scorching Ray, so just a bunch of good damage options and utility options added to our arsenal. Next level, we're going to fix these odd numbers to stop them from bothering everyone and get up to 18 Wisdom and 16 Dexterity. This gives us pretty solid initiative and AC for this level already, and then it only gets better from here. It's also great to be able to grab Blade Ward on this character, because then every character in this... Uh, Party is going to have access to Blade Ward again for emergencies. You'll notice I'm saying for emergencies a lot. Well, Honor Mode is hundreds of hours. There's going to be some emergencies, and it's nice to just have options while not compromising the, the overall strategy of your character. At level 5, we are going to make sure we have Mass Healing Word, because that will allow us to apply the powerful buff on heal items. Um to our party as well, and we get Spirit Guardians, which is going to be our main combat spell um, for most of the game. This will apply radiating orbs, as well as helping us mow down lots of small enemies. We also get Fireball for free, which just lets us burst enemies down if we need to. We, this character can also be our Animate Dead user, which is great as well. Um, also, we'll have Aid on this character, so if you're not using that from a camp follower, this character can be the one who casts it, giving you yet another powerful utility option for daylong buffing. Level 6, we get Improved Warding Flare, making the, our allies even less vulnerable, because we can defend them with Improved Warding Flare and Projected Ward now, um, as well as most of them having Shield. Character level 7, we get access to uh, Wall of Fire and Guardian of Faith, both very powerful spells. Guardian of Faith is an incredible summon that you can use to block doorways. It's also just a great ratio of damage to spell slot. A level 4 spell for 60 damage is awesome. You can even extend it further by casting Aid to give it more hit points or Warding uh, Bond to decrease damage that it's taking so that it uh, does less damage. I haven't tried projected ward on it. I don't actually know if it works, um, but I, I think it, it will probably work on the Guardian of Faith to let you do um, even more damage block. It won't work on the self damage, but it, it should work on if the enemies attack it um, to just extend its lifetime. And then uh, Wall of Fire, of course. This gives you two characters with access to Wall of Fire. Freedom of Movement, also another great um, panic button if you get stunned. Level 8, we get our feet, and we're going to grab Alert. This gives us plus 8 to our initiative rolls, which is awesome. This means that this character, unlike most clerics, will win initiative basically every time. And because we want to be stacking radiating orb effects and, and so on, uh, that is really good because it lets us clear small enemies out with our Spirit Guardians and stack radiating orbs right from the beginning on large uh, bosses. And then also get out of the way so that our um, Eldritch Knight or so that our Abjuration Wizard can tank if, if we need them to. 
Level 9, we get Destructive Wave, letting us knock over everything in an encounter while doing great damage. This also works really well if our enemies and allies are mixed up together, because it doesn't hit allies. And at level 10, we get Divine Intervention, giving us the best in slot weapon for this character. The healing aura is really good as well, because it applies the buff on heal items. Um, what cantrip we pick at this level does not matter, really. And then at Cleric level 11, we get access to Hero's Feast, which, if you're not using camp casting, is an incredible day-long buff that basically solves the only problem your party currently has, which is relatively weak wisdom saves on your Eldritch Knight. Uh, Hero's Feast will completely negate that issue, while also just giving you a bunch of other um, bonuses throughout the day, bonus HP and so on. And then finally, at the last level, we get to add our two to Wisdom. This build is both very simple to build and execute, and also plays extremely well. You have lots of options between Radiance of the Dawn damage and just the, the attack spells that you get from Light Cleric, as well as being able to just run around with Spirit Guardians up. It's not going to be outputting the most damage of any of your party members, or anything like that, but it's going to be such a solid utility character that I think it is really worth bringing a Light Cleric. It also makes the rest of your party basically impossible to kill, because between Projected Ward and Improved Warding Flare and the Shield spell and having Counter Spell on multiple characters, enemies trying to do stuff will run into so many reactions that they just won't be able to effectively engage in the combat. You also just get to do great damage with Spirit Guardians just running around and spamming out uh, one-shot spells as well. For items for this character, there's really two ways you can build it. You want the, um, the the buff on heal items, the Whispering Promise, Hellrider's Pride, and Boots of Aid and Comfort are all great. Those give you a bunch of buffs whenever you cast a mass healing word. Later on, you may want to swap those to our fourth character, um, because you're going to just want to be stacking up Radiating Orb, uh, effects as much as possible on this character because you're doing a bunch of radiant damage and radiating orb is very powerful. You just want whatever medium armor has is the best and doesn't have capped AC for your dexterity because we've got 16 dexterity. So the armor of agility is great. You can also, uh, and will give us 22 base AC with just the armor of agility and a normal shield. Just any, any normal shield will give us 22 AC, plus the defensive action of Warding Flare, which doesn't even cost a resource to use, and the defensive reactions of our other party members. The other thing that this character will want is some way of casting Misty Step. That's one downside of this character, is we don't have Misty Step on it itself. So you want one item that gives you Misty Step. Luckily, there's plenty of those, and you can uh, take your pick of which one you want to use for this character. The Night Walkers are really good, because you can't slip on Grease or Ice, and you will be making grease and ice surfaces for this character as, uh, uh, all over the battlefield with your abjuration wizard pretty frequently. For the fourth build, there's honestly a lot of directions you could take this. The other three builds give you so much leeway and so... Um, such a good foundation, such a rock-solid foundation, that you could build the fourth build in kind of any direction you wanted. But one thing that we haven't really covered is skills, so we're going to use a bard in order to cover the remaining skills. Which kind of bard we take is actually also open to interpretation, because um, a lore bard would fit extremely well in this party, giving you additional defensive reactions with cutting words and earlier counter spells, um, which are very powerful as well. Uh, but we're going to go with a swords bard, just because swords bards are incredibly broken and give you a lot of damage. I do want to mention that lore bard fits very well thematically, though, for this party, so if you're interested in a more defensively oriented party, that's a great way to build this uh party as well. For Swords Bard, we are going to go with... Oh, I already did it. We're going to go with a stat split that is more archery focused, because we are going to go with a, a an archer build for our Swords Bard, of course, in order to bring a massive amount of damage and control to our party. And so we're going to take high dexterity and constitution, and only 14 in charisma. This still gives us great dialogue skills, just because we're a bard, we're going to get dialogue expertise, expertise in our dialogue skills, so we'll be able to... Um, pass all the important dialogue checks, as well as open all the locks. And for our skill selection, we are going to make sure that we have Sleight of Hand and make sure that we have Persuasion. Those are the two most important skills in the entire game. With Jack of All Trades from Bard, we're going to have decent values in all the skills. So it's not something that we need to worry about that much. Um, but 
we just want to make sure that we have at least two of the dialogue skills, whichever ones you think are best, but persuasion is definitely one of them that you're going to want. And then you can also pick up perception and, on this character if you use the guild artisan background, which is probably the best background for a party face, you can take insight and persuasion. This character also works very well for an Astarian origin character, um, because Astarian gets huge bonuses to his attacks, which this character is going to be making a lot of. So if you don't want to use a tab for this, then Astarian is a great pick for this as well. This character will be our party face and lock picker and cover all the utility aspects while also outputting massive damage and contributing very powerfully to the control, um, c the, to the character's control of the enemies as well. In the early game, we're going to go with this stat split. We're later going to swap to the Gloves of Dexterity and drop our Dexterity to 8 and then bring our Charisma up to 16 and Wisdom up to 14 because this character will end up wanting to boost those stats as well. So you can definitely go with that stat split as well. That's not required if you don't like using the stat items. You can definitely continue with this stat split through the whole game, but it will give you a small ad advantage in the late game. Um... So that's probably the optimal play. For our cantrip selection, we're going to make sure we have Vicious Mockery because we're going to need that for the Band of the Mystic Scoundrel, which is one thing that this gives us uh, a, an enormous boost to, is just giving us a little bit of extra damage on that for free, uh, on our turns for free, as well as access to um, friends because we're going to be a party face, so having friends is useful. You can cast this and then just leave the area and, you, and people won't get mad at you. For our spell selection, we're going to go with spells that mostly don't have saves. So we're going to go with Healing Word. But remember, we already have Long Strider on the Eldritch Knight, so we don't need it on this character. You can grab Disguise Self and Speak with Animals. Those are both available from, um, from potions and stuff like that. So we're just going to grab this. We're going to make sure we have Dissonant Whispers and Tasha's Hideous Laughter, which are going to come up later on. Band of the Mystic Scoundrel plus Tasha's is one of the most powerful things you can do, so it's good to grab that. Character level 2, we get Song of Rest, which is awesome, obviously, and Jack of All Trades, boosting our, our skills to massive levels for all of our skills. You can, again, just grab other utility spells at this point, um, because our save DCs won't be super high. You just want to grab any spells that you are missing for utility, we could pick Featherfall here, for example, at this level and then swap it out later on because it's always nice to have access to that somewhere in your party. Bard level 3, we're going to take College of Swords, giving us access to the Flourishes, which give us massive additional damage thanks to Slashing Flourish, just doubling your attacks and doing an extra d6 of damage or extra inspiration die of damage. For our fighting style, we're going to take two weapon fighting because there are times you're going to want to use an offhand hand crossbow instead of a two-handed bow. This will mostly be a two-handed bow build, but the offhand hand crossbow is better sometimes if you happen to have better ones than your best bow. The Titan bow, Titan string bow plus strength elixirs is probably your best bet, but if you're drinking strength elixirs on your Eldritch Knight, maybe you don't want that. Um, and then later on, the dead shot is my favorite bow in the game just because it hits more accurately and that's even better. Uh, for our spell selection here, we are going to make sure that we learn Cloud of Daggers, and then also at this level you want to grab... Um, we can replace one of the other spells that's a little bit less useful with something like Hold Person, which we're going to want much later on once we get access to the Band of the Mystic Scoundrel and the Helm of Arcane Acuity, since that's one of the most broken combos in the game, is using bonus action Hold Persons with that. Level 4, we get a feat, and our feat is, of course, going to be Sharpshooter to increase our damage massively, and that's part of why we're going to go with the Gloves of Dexterity for this build, because that lets us get a feat, um, let us, lets us grab Sharpshooter, but also still have very high Dexterity and high chance to hit. And then for our Cantrip selection here, this is another good place to fit True Strike in, but probably we should grab Blade Ward. And then um, here, we're just going to grab Enhance Ability. You won't cast this this often, but it's nice to have this on your party face for when you're trying to gain advantage on checks. Most of the time, friends will do a better job of this and um, anyways, because most of the things you want to use this spell on are Charisma checks, and so friends will do a better job than Enhance Ability, but it's still nice to have. 
And then at Bard level 5, we get access to Font of Inspiration, so all our Inspiration dice come back on a short rest, which is awesome. And then we can take higher level spells. Again, we're looking for Enchantment or Illusion spells, so we can bonus action cast them. So things like Hypnotic Pattern and Fear are very powerful here. And then we get extra attack at bard level 6, giving us uh, additional attacks with our bows, so we can make multiple flourish attacks in a single round. Grab the other illusion spells that we don't have yet, and then we're going to take a brief detour away from Swords Bard in order to pick up some other things. We're going to detour here into Fighter, because Fighter is going to give us Archery Fighting Style, making our attacks much more likely to land. In combination with Sharpshooter, this is very important, because then you can get advantage on all your attacks using, say, the Risky Ring or other sources of advantage. You'll have Bless from your party members. And then Archery Fighting Style, so that'll mitigate the the downsides of your sharpshooter attacks, meaning that you're much more likely to land your attacks very regularly. This character will have some issues with chances to hit in up until you get fi uh, archery fighting style, which is why it's so useful to have the Gloves of Dexterity, to have Bless, and um, this fighter level later on. Then we're going to grab Action Surge from our second fighter level, so we can do the whole thing over again. Um, Action Surge is an, adds incredibly to our burst damage, which obviously makes this character wildly more powerful. At the next level, we are going back into Bard just to get access to higher level spells, um, as well as to continue to improve our Inspiration dice and eventually hit our Magical Secrets, which will be very important for the late game. Here, it's pretty nice to grab plant growth. It's a non-concentration, non-save DC using spell, so when you don't have arcane acuity stacked, you can use plant growth to trap enemies inside of damaging spell effects. And then at bard level 8, we get another feat, and here we are going to once again grab alert. Alert is just so good, even on a dexterity focus build. We'll have 18 dexterity at this point with the dex gloves. You could also at this point take... Uh, a, a dexterity increase. Um, you could also, for this build, use Ethel's Hair, if that's something that you're interested in doing, and start with 16 dex, though that means that your charisma is going to be relatively, or 17 dex, and boost it to 18 with the hair. Um, that means your charisma is going to be relatively low, so uh, I like just grabbing Alert on this build, and that means this character will always go first with 18 dexterity and Alert. You'll have plus 4 to your initiative, or uh, plus 9 to your initiative rolls, meaning that you are going to beat basically every enemy in the game, and can stack your Arcane Acuity, and knock over enemies very easily. Then we are going to uh, grab for our spells. Um, greater Invisibility can be self-cast on this character. If you took self prof uh, stealth proficiency, you can sometimes get a couple free attacks in before combat starts, which lets you stack um, acuity before the combat starts. Confusion is also an enchantment spell that you can bonus action cast, so we'll just grab that. Bard level 9, you get access to 5th level spells, of which there's not any particularly of note, although Hold Monster is again a bonus action cast that will give you automatic critical hits. And then at Bard level 10, we get Magical Secrets, which is why we went all the way up to, to 10 levels in Swords Bard. You could also do a Fighter 4 split or add in a level of War Cleric, something along those lines. But going to Fighter uh, to Bard level 10 is really nice because it gets us access to some of the spells that we wouldn't otherwise have access to. And in this case, we're going to take Counterspell, so we have a second cast of Counterspell in our party, and Hunger of Hadar, because we don't have Hunger of Hadar, which is the only really powerful spell in the game left that we don't have. Another option is honestly just to grab Misty Step if you don't have gear that gives it to you with this character or aren't playing a Githyanki. Very useful to play a Githyanki on this character for the Misty Step as well. Um, but Hunger of Hadar is basically the only top tier spell that we don't currently have access to in this party, so being able to pick that up at, at Bard level 10 means we'll have it for the late game, and it's still so good even in the very late game that it's just always worth grabbing. And then for our Bard spells, we are going to just grab anything here that we feel like we might be missing. We pr maybe haven't picked up utility or uh, invisibility if we haven't found a scroll of it for our wizard, so you can pick that up. And then here, it is once again time to pick up True Strike to piss off people in the comments. We also get access to uh, skill expertises, which is really nice here as well. Or, um, yeah, we get, we get access to skill 
to additional skills so we can pick up some additional skill selections here and pick up, say, sleight of hand and perception expertise. Uh, and that makes us even more likely to pass all of our skill checks. This character has slightly stricter gear requirements because Swords Bard is a relatively greedy character in this game um, because you're going to want the Helmet of Arcane Acuity. That means whenever you hit enemies with arrows, you will stack Arcane Acuity to increase your save DCs. And the Band of the Mystic Scoundrel on this character because that gives you uh, the ability to cast Quickened Illusions and Enchantments, which, of course, is very good. Um, we are going to want... Another medium armor, ideally one that's not dex capped so that we can cast our spells, as many of the special arrows as we have access to, and the gloves of dexterity so that we will have high dexterity and can boost our charisma back up. All of those uh, together are very useful as well. For our, we will have shield proficiency from our fighter level, so you can grab a shield. Any shield is good on this character, just in, you can use it while wielding a bow, and the best two handed bow you have available. I like the dead trot or the titan string bow if you're using elixirs, or you can use the titan string bow with the club of hill giant strength if you don't like. Uh, chugging elixirs every day. Also good is stuff like the Knife of the Undermountain King that increases your crit chances and just gives you more damage. Knife of the Undermountain King works, the passive works even when you have a bow equipped. It works on the bow, so it just increases your overall damage. This character is one of the most broken characters in the game, just high damage and massively difficult to resist control spells that you can cast with bonus actions, which is very powerful. Also, of course, you're just a full caster with action surge. If you don't want to take the fighter levels, you could um, just go 12 Swords Bard. The one downside is you lose archery fighting style, which is very good for this build, so I do recommend the fighter levels. Um, again, also, if you don't feel like you need magical secrets, a level of war cleric is pretty reasonable for this build. That gets you heavy armor, not that you need it because you have high dexterity, um, as well as access to uh, an additional bonus action attack every... Uh, a couple times per day, just for a few more attacks if you want additional damage. Putting it all together, we have this party capable of doing incredible amounts of control, uh, having extremely powerful defensive capabilities because of the projected ward from our Abjuration Wizard, who's almost invincible just in his own right. And look at the ACs across the board on these uh, characters. They all have shield proficiencies, and they can all... Um, defend themselves pretty well because of uh, the extremely high ACs. The lowest AC is 19 on our wizard, who, which is great because that means he's going to be attacked, and as the Abjuration Wizard, you want him to be attacked for the retaliation damage. And we have uh, Warding Flare from our Light Cleric, as well as Projected Ward from our wizard, which we can use to prevent damage to ourselves if necessary. We have massive damage output from the Swords Bard and from the Eldritch Knight, and all the utility spells covered, all the best control spells in the game are covered, as well as a flock of summons if we want them available. So when you put it all together, this party basically covers every possible base. You get every skill. You get uh, you get good access to every skill from your bard. You get great access to um, every spell selection from your wizard, who also gets the secret spells. You have powerful summons. You do enormous amounts of damage. You have every base covered for utility. And you're very, very hard to kill thanks to the extremely powerful defensive options. If you want even more skill access and want to lean more defensive, you could swap the sword bard for a lore bard. That would give you even better access to all the skills and even more defensive options earlier. Um, but this is sort of the more damage oriented one that uses more broken combos. As well, we access almost all of the best, the most broken features in the game. Abjuration Wizard is broken, Radiant Orb Stacking is broken, um, Arcane Acuity is broken, and we get to use all of those in this party. A Tavern Brawler is broken, so we get to use all of those in this party. The only real weakness of this party, or the things that we're missing out on, are we don't get to um, just delete single enemies with massive damage, like a uh, Lightning Build would. We still get lots of... Uh, damage and can kill most enemies, but we don't get guaranteed damage like the lightning builds. Um, and we don't have repeated crowd control from a Tavern Brawler Monk. So those are two things that we're missing from sort of the potential um, f from amongst the most powerful builds in Baldur's Gate. But we basically get access to every single other good thing you can be doing in Honor Mode, and all of them together make for an incredibly powerful party that protects each other very well while outputting massive damage. A lot of times in combat, you could just 
past the turn um, like four or five times and enemies wouldn't even hit you thanks to your high ACs and defensive capabilities. You have two counter spells. You have guidance uh, multiple times over. You have multiple casts of Sanctuary, so you're very uh, covered when it comes to defensive options as well. Everybody has Misty Step, so you have all your mobility options covered and everything there. All right, my friends, hope that you enjoyed this video. This is, I think, one of the best picks for just a basic run at honor mode if you're looking to just get your honor mode win this will be both extremely fun to play and extremely powerful um and let me know if you like this kind of video it was a little longer than my normal fare but uh hopefully you enjoyed it and if people enjoy this i'll be back with more specific like themed parties and stuff like that and we can continue on from there all right my friends as always if you enjoyed the video please feel free to leave a comment uh like the video both of those help me out a ton with the algorithm especially when i try out new stuff like this it's really nice to get um interaction with it because it helps people see it and we can figure out if, if folks like the new formats uh and of course you can subscribe to my channel for more of this and other strategy game content cheers folks i'll catch you next time